Okay, we're about uh, four minutes after. We'll go ahead and uh, start with our presentation today. Uh, I'd like to start off with saying, if you've ever seen this happen at your plant, you may not be a wind site, but things do break at plants, right? So this is a definitely a, an example of a worst case scenario for a wind site. Uh, we know that at plants, at power plants, they have lots of motors and pumps and that you have had catastrophic failures. Uh, so we're gonna go over today and talk about using uh, predictive analytics to help with preventing disasters uh, and go through that. We go next slide. Uh, today, uh, we're, again, like we said, we talk about how we modernize our, our power plants and cut costs through AI and machine learning. Uh, we're gonna go through today. I'm uh, the host. Uh, my name is Evan Seacock. I'm the director of NER Compliance here at CERTREC. And our main presenter is Greg Wolf. Uh, he is president and CEO of Fisher Block. And uh, he's going to give us a lot of information today on how uh, his device can help us with uh, you know, the AI and machine learning and how that will help prevent uh, disasters uh, using their device. Next slide. And then go through the agenda, uh, which went through our introductions. Uh, we'll talk about challenges, um, the relationship between Fisher Block and Surtrack, how predictive analytics can help in challenges, uh, talk about some use cases, talk about how easy it is to install. It really is very easy to install these. Uh, look at fault recording for NERC compliance and other things within NERC, and then go through conclusions and we'll do questions and answers at the end. Um, here at Surtech, one of the some of the things that we're looking at and helping our clients with um, and our focus areas that we are doing is, of course, we do compliance uh, using uh, SaaS applications uh, and also our services. Uh, there's a number of plants and facilities out there that use our services either in the nuclear world or in the NERC world. Uh, the other item lo looking to do is more digitization within the power system itself, you know, taking some of the old analog systems and converting those and trying to make all that easy going into digitization. And then also looking at cybersecurity for utilities down the road. Of course, we've seen some big issues there, not only from cyber, but also physical. Uh, so again, our bottom line mission here is to help generators be more reliable and secure for a better and safer grid. And of course, we're doing that from SaaS applications and technology uh, to help reduce uh, the uh, the items, the compliance actors, items for GOs and GOPs. Next slide. Um, and, and of course, like I said, we have Fisher Block with us. Uh, they have been putting together and, and coming up with some really good ideas on how to help plants uh, with their asset monitoring. Uh, they have their device that we'll get into here a little bit more. We'll look at not only wind, but also uh, generation all types. Uh, it can be solar sites, it can be uh, battery facilities, and then of course our normal, you know, power generations where you have combustion turbines, steam turbines, wherever you, whatever your fuel might be for boiling the water, you know, from nuclear to natural gas, oil, uh, coal, whatever it might be, you have lots and lots of electrical support out in those uh, plants that this will help with uh, your assets and monitoring those assets. Next slide. Of course, some of the challenges that are faced by utility today are, um, demands to increase the reliability, availability, and efficiency. And of course, with that, all those items lead into cost, right? So there's a lot of costs by looking at trying to uh, uh, reduce any kind of availability issues, you know, looking at it from predictive um, maintenance and going forward and plan equipment failures as we show you know, the guys trying to push the rock up the hill. You know, all these are items that we have to uh, overcome, you know, each of the sites have to overcome to make sure that they are efficient and reliable and you know the bottom line is to make sure that they're being their schedule for uh, making cost goals um, this looks at you know looking at equipment health you know and unknowns that go with that and then also you know doing work out in the plant any kind of maintenance is, is very costly so all these all add up you know to the risk of failing you know adds to additional costs and sufficient availability to monitor the plants so all these things are continue to increase the cost and look at the cost driving up and you know what we're looking at here is ways to help reduce those costs. We go to the next slide. And then continuing into this is lack of visibility. Right now, there's not necessarily a lot of information that comes from these large motors, large power systems within the plants themselves. Looking at uh, you know the windmill uh, uh, systems themselves, there's not information that's already out there that can pull this data and look at it intelligently. So. Uh, 
looking at all these challenges that we look at, of course, staff is not increasing, it's decreasing. And then with that decrease is a decrease in knowledge base. And all these, of course, uh, limited staff, knowledge base reductions will increase restoration times. Um, also increase the risk uh, and decrease efficiency. So all this comes together and what we're trying to do here is help with that, help with the limited staff, you know, so we can increase the visibility uh, via the information and the, uh, the data that comes from the Fisher Block systems. Next slide. So, so one of the things we want to look at, you know, we we talked about AI, you know, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, how do we overcome some of these challenges? Of course, a big part of it is if you can do early warning uh, alerts to protect against unwanted surprise. Uh, if you have something out there that's monitoring the system and looking at changes in state, whatever it might be, and we'll get into that a little bit, Rick. We'll go into some examples and we'll talk about those. A big part of that is what changes. Uh, you know, in state of the motor or a pump, you know, looking at it and trying to get that information so you can say, okay, I am looking at a possible failure here. What can we do? Then also, uh, of course, goes with that is we want to meet the management's uh, reliability, availability uh, goals that they have because uh, they're they're under pressure to make sure the plant provides and produces what it's supposed to and stays available. And it doesn't mean it stops just at power plants, but also into uh, other industries, you know, like chemical plants, you know. Uh, everyday uh, manufacturing that uses large power coming in for a lot of its systems, uh, you know, looking at all that. So you want to get into uh, ways to find that, which gets into predictive analytics, right, Greg? We, we're kind That's of right. That. I mean, and, and, I, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about our, our solution and our technology and, uh, and how it uh, is leveraged by the search track portal, which we'll talk more about uh, in the coming slides. But on this particular uh, slide here, the predictive analytics uh, and providing that early warning system is how most of our customers are using our platform. Uh, many of implementations start out with providing visibility where they don't have it today, such as on electromechanical relay panels. Uh, if a breaker trips, uh, many times the customers don't or the operators don't have the information to understand why the break, breaker tripped. And so that is a big part of what we provide in terms of visibility. However, being online, monitoring these signals 24-7, we've over the years learned that there's patterns that develop uh, before a breaker ever trips that indicate and, and, and provide an early warning uh, system that something is degrading it within the asset, the pump, the motor, the breaker, the transformer. And so we've created a platform and a portal to provide that information in an in a organized, structured way uh, with statistical thresholds and dashboards and alert notifications to avoid uh, Excel spreadsheets and you know paper trails and have it more systemized so that uh, management and operators have uh, kind of a structured way to monitor their assets. And we've got some examples today that we'll uh, run through. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So it's, uh, part of what you're saying too, is since it is a, a digital platform and information goes across, it comes to them, you, we don't have as much reliance on the spreadsheets, right? That's right. We're trying to uh, provide a platform whereby you don't need spreadsheets, um, that the software does the statistical analysis, provides the results, shows how that uh, is performing over time. So the trend analysis is right there. Um, however, we do provide export buttons so that um, the data and the results that we do collect can be exported into third-party systems and or, you know, including Excel. Yeah, you have, to, you have to get that information out there somehow. So yeah, sometimes it does end up that way. <laughs> okay. Next slide. So, so sorry, this is our ahead. platform here. Basically, our, our solution and platform is comprised of both hardware sensors, which we call smart blocks, edge devices, as well as our predictive analytics software package. And so what the way this works is we put a number of devices in a substation or in an industrial plant. 
And our devices then are each intelligent. So they're not just blindly sending all of the electrical waveforms to the server, but rather they're doing high speed analysis and recording of the electrical signals, making decisions on what is of interest and what is normal. And anything of interest then is either counted into the uh, and stored in the smart block for transmittal later to the software or the waveform is captured and sent to the software where it is then further analyzed and, and archived for trends and comparisons to a larger population. And then the integration with the SearchTrack platform we'll talk more about later in the, in the presentation is then how the uh, users and operators are then notified and can uh, log in and, and see what what the uh, situation is as well. Just real quick, I want folks to kind of focus on that uh, the size of their smart block. You'll see how it looks against the switch gear in a minute. They're not really big. I mean, the pictures always make it look bigger than it is, but you'll see in here in a minute that how it, big it, it really it's is. like having an iPhone or a smartphone on every yeah, circuit. That's um, right. It's about you know a couple inches thick, but uh, it's about the same size as a as an iPhone or a chalkboard eraser. So this is uh, just showing the inner workings of a rotating machine. Uh, this happens to be uh, a wind turbine. The technology to monitor this through the electrical signal analysis is the same as for uh, motors or uh, an industrial plant. So what we do, or our, our platform is looking at the electrical signal, in this case, generated by the generator, or it could be the electrical signal consumed by the motor and the slight distortions that show up in those signals over time, they repeat, patterns develop, and our software can then associate those distortions with various aspects of the machine, whether that be shaft imbalance, blade problems, bearing issues, winding problems, hot spots, imbalances, and so forth. And then our dashboard uh, provides kind of a real intuitive way to see if something's out of the norm that should be scheduled for a proactive maintenance activity. And interestingly, while we're focused on the electrical signal, in many cases, mechanical problems actually affect the electrical signal very subtly. But in the naked eye, you would most times not be able to tell this the electrical signal is just slightly distorted and it's caused by a frequency at which a mechanical item is operating. So a, a gear tooth mesh frequency or a roller bearing frequency, those will be different than 60 Hertz. And those frequencies actually show up in the 60 Hertz fundamental signal. And so we're able to then track various electrical and mechanical uh, phenomenon over time by by continually 24 seven monitoring the electrical signals in high resolution. So yeah, you've probably seen this uh, picture here, Evans, at many of the, the plants you visited. Um, this is a situation where there's a substation, there was about 40 circuits, uh, 38 circuits looks like, and all being monitored by electromechanical relays. And for those in the audience that may not be aware of what electromechanical relay is, it's basically a device that's monitoring the circuit. It will trip a breaker if there's an unsafe condition out in the city, in the in, across the network. When it does command the breaker to trip, it does not save or collect or store any information, any data. So the, the engineer, the utility engineer and operator is left with virtually no information as to why the breaker tripped. And then therefore, in order to restore that breaker, there's quite a bit of activity that has to happen in terms of identifying why it tripped, resolving the problem, and then testing to make sure everything's safe before everything gets turned back on. So the initial focus of our company back in 2017 time from 18, when we launched the product line, was to provide this visibility to operators and actually catch the signal as the breaker tripped and capture why it is that those electromechanical relays tripped the breaker. Did phase A short the ground? Did phase A short the phase C? How long that lasted? Did the relay operate correctly? Did the breaker trip correctly? And so 
we provide visibility where they haven't had it before. And that then has then brought us to the point of now we're looking and seeing patterns that develop before the relays ever trip. And we can then provide predictive analytics. But in this particular case, this customer had breaker trips. They were lasting, you know, on and off periodically over the course of several months. Their customers were uh, very prominent customers, uh, universities, uh, vaccine research. And over the course of the last few years, that became a real big deal. And so they had to better understand why these breakers were tripping. And so our platform was chosen uh, to come in and provide them the visibility. And inside of two days, all we did was retrofit the covers over those test switches that you see there with no outage at all. Um, and no hard tools, no change to any of the infrastructure, all the wiring stayed in place. We merely uh, put our devices over as retrofit covers. We have spring-loaded pins that make contact with the voltage uh, blades underneath. And then we have split core CTs that plug in in the back inside those panels without disrupting any secondary wiring. And so inside of a couple of days, then they had visibility on 40 circuits. And then it was inside of I think 10 days when we captured the first breaker trip and our devices all talked together. So all 40 of our devices triggered simultaneously and they had not only visibility of the circuit that caused the initial trip, but also how that fault propagated across the various buses and feeders and provided them the information they needed to understand why this is happening. And uh, so now with that justified the rollout across uh, dozens of substations now. So this is one of uh, the more exciting uh, uh, use cases of our device, I think. So it, sound, so it sounds like they chose using Fisher Block over a uh, existing, like a digital thought recorder uh, system. They decided on using y'all mainly probably because of the information it gave you know, from a AI standpoint, you know, also wave analysis, but also ease of installation. That, that's a good point because many times we hear, well, we we can implement it, we can install a DFR and get, get this type of information. Well, that may be true in, for certain cases. Typically a DFR is a very large piece of equipment at one end of the, of the substation and therefore requires significant rewiring of the substation to bring wire, all the wires over to the DFR and then back to their uh, relay or, or test switch, what have you. And all of that rewiring then requires drawings in advance and you know, quite a bit of engineering work that can take months, if not years. Um, and so that's one of the real benefits of our platform is that it requires no change to any uh, existing wiring. So uh, the drawings really just identify that the cover is being replaced on the test switches. And so inside of a couple of days, rather than months or even years, we now have 30 microprocessors monitoring or 40 monitoring these 40 circuits instead of one microprocessor so, trying to monitor 40 down at the end of the substation. So yeah, which I, think, which I think shows us on the next slide if you go to that. Right. So this is behind the panel. Uh, on the left here is behind the panel of what we were just looking at previously. And what you can see, if you look closely, there's an insulated cable coming out of one of the uh, mounting holes just to the next to the test switch. So we actually replaced one of the mounting bolts for that test switch with a hollowed out version. Uh, we call it a smart bolt. It's actually patented smart bolt. And so we run a tiny uh, cable through there that has the uh, the reference and the three wires then for phase A, B, and C. And so we're able to then, just by replacing that mounting bolt, bring a cable through to the back. And there, you can't tell, but those little CTs that we have snapped around those secondary wires, they open and close, they're hinged. So there's no uh, need to open up any of those secondary wires, therefore no outage. Um, it's just plug and play. And then on the right there, that's an example. If you can walk behind the panel as easy as the front, some substations, uh, you know, every substation is different as we probably, uh, most of us know. If you can walk in the back of the panel, then you can just uh, mount our test or our smart block to the back of a test switch, no need for a mounting bolt and snap on the CTs right there. 
it's a very quick install, five minute install in that case uh, to get the visibility. So really what we're picking up with, with the uh, Fisher block, this information is voltage inputs and CT in inputs. And that's really all that goes into this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about from a communication standpoint, how's, how do the communications work with the uh, Fisher block? Right, so our devices, there's two modes of communication that are native. One is ethernet, you know, standard ethernet to a uh, router in the substation then out to the customer's network or some of our customers will actually put the server right in the substation. Um, and so we have ethernet communication with all the high resolution waveform transfer that, that takes place. We also though do communicate DMP3 and so many of our implementations, not only do we stream waveform and high resolution data to the wave IQ, but we also stream DMP3 SCADA information to third party SCADA systems. Okay, it's actually all very, very simple, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. All right, excellent. So just well, here's an example whereby we're monitoring 24 seven, those same circuits we just talked about, but instead of being in a traditional grid or substation out on the grid, it's actually a substation in an industrial campus, which are typically called motor control cabinets, but they look virtually the same as a substation. We mount our device in that substation on the panel, just as we were just looking at, but now we're able to monitor the electrical current consumption by some of these large motors. And we're 24 seven looking at these slight distortions in those electrical signals to see if the motor is drawing current in a different way that might be indi indicative of a, uh, a degradation of an internal component. Likewise, any generator on the campus, uh, we're monitoring those signals as well. In this particular case, we noticed, or our software noticed, there was a little bit of a jitter around the fundamental, plus or minus one hertz around 60. And you can see in that slide there, it's typically uh, coined like the devil's horns. They're basically these sidebands that grow in magnitude over time. And you can see they're quite a bit uh, above the noise floor, very easy to see in that picture. But several weeks and months before that picture was uh, taken, those those sidebands were only slightly above the uh, noise floor. And so having a low noise floor is very important. It's, it's basically called dynamic range. Um, and then also having software that can detect these sidebands as they come out of the noise and then trend their magnitudes on a trend chart over time. And when they reach a certain level, then the alert, you know, the, the greens turn to yellow, eventually turn to red, but operators are warned in many weeks and months in advance. So they're all watching that, planning their maintenance so that they can avoid then a catastrophic failure. Because in this case, those sidebands are indicative of overheating um, rotor bar joints. And so it's not an even balance of uh, current based on a, a even balance of flux, if you will across that uh, air gap. And so if that joint were to ever crack, develop a crack and a piece of metal fly off at 1800 RPMs right through all the windings, you know, that would be a catastrophic failure. And this particular customer had told us they're out $10,000 a minute when they're out of production. And so after a few hours, you know, that's almost $2 million, let alone when they restore the problem or fix the problem, then they got to uh, clear out all their pro manufacturing processing, whatever that manufacturing process might be. In this place, it was in this case, it was chemicals. Uh, they were out for or could have been out for two days um, on a on a, a two hour motor problem. And so that's really something that's real exciting about this technology is not just capturing a waveform if a breaker trips, but actually providing predictive analytics so that a breaker never does trip. I see that as a, a big deal, the predictive analytics, uh, you know, especially for folks that are trying to watch out doing, you know, and, and reduce their cost from uh, maintenance. You know, instead of just doing generic maintenance, you can actually watch it now and see when you need to do maintenance, some changes and signatures coming back, which is right. a, a real big benefit. 
And, you know, again, also, you know, you talked about downtime, you know, not only is it the downtime, but also the replacement cost. you know, if it did failure, like you said, a full failure, the, the motor's probably pretty expensive there. So you save yeah, the motor. Replace the, the motor. Yeah. yeah. You know, now it's just general components. You don't have to do stator necessarily, maybe just a rotor in this case. That's okay. right. And many times the maintenance folks will watch these trend charts and then at a convenient time, we'll go in and do a physical inspection, maybe even a, a portable electrical test, um, or maybe do a temperature reading or some, some sort. Um, but they're able to do it in a, in a, uh, an efficient way without impacting their, their operations. And so it's, it's really providing visibility that uh, many of them have just never had before. And so, yeah, once I was blind, but now I can see. So, yeah, that's uh, that that is what uh, what, what the system provides. It's, it's very exciting. And you know, we talk about easy install. You know, and I know I have a background in power plants being out there. I know that we used to have to, and you know, sometimes to do these kind of analytics and you know, fast Fourier analysis type, we'd have to put in a machine for temporary uh, installation and then take it back out, which was a lot of money. You know, trying to install it. This is just simply putting it in now as a as a cover on the test switch, you don't have to go through all that wire. You don't have to have all the maintenance people lined up and, and take the downtime. You can just put it in. So it's very much easier to do. Yeah, you know, that's a good point because we visited industrial plants and they've, they've told us that they have programs where they'll have um, maintenance personnel on a periodic basis, once every six months or once every year, actually go and measure these electrical signals uh, going being consumed by motors or emanating out of generators and portable equipment will come in, they'll do the four, fast Fourier transform and extract all those frequency components. Um, and then they can kind of use Excel over time and, and see if there's any trends. And so when we install our devices, they in some cases have had a baseline to look at, but what became apparent fairly quickly was that from one day to the next, um, what might look like a problem on one day is, is doesn't show up the next, or, um, it, it may be a degrading asset that only exhibits these frequency distortions under certain environmental conditions that don't exist every day. And so what we see in our trends, and we do these scans twice a day, all year long, and our device is looking for certain load conditions. So when that current hits a certain level, we take a scan. And so therefore our scans are done under consistent environmental and load conditions. So it's kind of apples to apples as we go forward. But even then we will not see a, uh, a, a certain distortion in electrical signal every single day, but no doubt we will see it getting more and more prevalent, more and more higher, higher in magnitude, whereby we eliminate the false negatives as well as the false positives by doing these scans every day. And we have a platform then that allows a quick, easy installation and it provides you this advanced analytics that typically has only been done once a year in the most advanced maintenance departments to every single day. So it's, it's very exciting. And so we have a number of customers uh, across kind of the three segments of generation, delivery, as well as consumption uh, that are using our platform and, you know, more and more each day. And so, yeah, here's kind of the full, the full system here. I mean, it shows our device right next to a uh, state-of-the-art relay. And so we, we get asked, you know, do, does it make sense to install one of our sensors, Fisher Block Smart? Uh, block and smart sensor next to or on a panel that has a digital relay. And what we say is, well, the relay is there to trip the breaker when there's an unsafe condition out in the in the community and also to capture that waveform when the breaker does trip. However, typical digital relay is not doing the predictive analytics that can be uh, leveraged by a platform like ours, where we're monitoring those electrical signals 24 seven, we do capture the waveform if the breaker trips, um, 
but we're also monitoring these distortions that I've talked about today 24 seven before a breaker ever were to trip. And so we then can provide information into Wave IQ and then through the search rec portal to the operators of these plants that uh, can be leveraged to resolve problems before a breaker ever does trip so that that digital relay never does have to trip the breaker. So that's a big uh, differentiator. So we actually work as a replacement or, or an electromechanical panel. We provide the waveform if a breaker trips, but also as a complement to providing predictive analytics on panels that do have uh, digital relays. Yeah, so as part of that, and as we're showing with this particular um, uh, screen here, we're talking about with Surtrack. So what we would do is we're working, we're working with Fisher to get the information in. And the reason why we're talking about coming into the Surtrack portals is we have actually very secure uh, systems. Uh, we have actually our servers are in a very uh, secure location. They're actually FedRAMP certified. Uh, for those that understand that, that's actually a real big deal. This means it stays within the U.S. for the most part, and there's other things that go along with that. But at the same time, we all the data that we transfer and and, and information at rest is all encrypted. So uh, information in, in transit and at rest, all of that information is encrypted so that nobody can actually get to it. And you know, we have actually a lot of folks that depend on our uh, encryption and our quality of our servers. You know, we uh, Trek has an ISO. 27,001 and a SOC 2 type 2 examination, which says that we meet all of these requirements. You know, we have very strong data and, and, and processes to make sure that all of our information stays secure. And so that way, once it gets through our portal, then we can give it and provide that information back to anybody anywhere via our portal. Mm -hmm. And so, so not only I was going to let me go ahead and do the NERC right quick. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'll let you add in no as problem. we need to. So, so no as problem. one of the big things that from a monitoring standpoint is PRC2, which is disturbance monitoring and reporting requirements. Um, not only can, uh, you know, they can do sequence events. We can look at all these on like, like Greg has been talking about. You can look at the things that trip. We can have a sequence of events to understand what's going on within the bus with a lot of sites, older sites especially, they do not have any kind of digital fault recorder. They don't have, and not all the relays record the information with the, with these devices being on all the switch gear uh, panels, you know, in a lineup. You can look at what's going on. You can get a feel for what's going on interactively between the various loads. And you pull that information in a look and get a better story of what really did happen where you didn't before. A lot of times there's just not enough information, you know, in the older plants when you're trying to figure out what happened how things happen, what things look like uh, in the old days, especially with just electromechanical, where this one will pull on all the rest of the information to help you. And also meet the requirements of uh, what they call dynamic disturbance uh, recording. Um, since this is recording all the time, it can re record and capture the waveforms coming out, current and voltage out of generators, you know, to meet PRC2. And the other part of it meets is bar two, uh, for generator over voltage you know, operation, looking at voltages, schedules, making sure they're staying. If you don't, some plants, older plants don't necessarily have a very good way of looking at all that information, making sure they're meeting their schedules uh, as required by the transmission operator. So this information can also be fed, you know, real time back to an operator so that they stay within their voltage schedules. So it's, it's also very useful in helping with the NERC compliance. Greg, anything else you want to add? Yeah, the other thing I, I was going to add to that is that, uh, you know, in PRC2 and VAR2 here, there's very specific requirements in terms of sample rates and how many cycles or seconds uh, the signals have to be captured and stored leading up to a fall, during fall, and post fall. And so that's something that our engineering teams early on. Um, really focused on to make sure that we not only provided predictive analytics, uh, but also we complied with the, you know, these very strict um, requirements that uh, these plants are under here, PRC2 and VAR2. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's, that is a big part of it. I mean, having that, the right information um, for disturbances, right. uh, the, the NERC guys, if you have a disturbance over one area, they want to look at it from a time-based standpoint and see how it's affecting your plant. So you got to have all those, meet those requirements. So we'll go through the right. conclusions here real quick. Uh, it is definitely a way of improving your uh, return on investment using these because it's very 
very easy to install. There's not a lot of engineering that has to go in with any kind of site, as, as he had explained, Greg explained, these are basically bolt on. Uh, so there's really no wiring. You don't have to get a lot of engineering. Probably, you know, some places are gonna want to track that these are out there, but it's a very small amount of work compared to having to do a full wiring that you might with a digital fault reporter, you know, just to show that it's there. Most cases, you know, most people will go, yeah, we know they're on there, it's okay. So not a lot of cost to be installed. So pretty good, uh, you know, return on investment there. Then also looking at it from the standpoint of making sure, you know, how to come up with your um, PMs. You know, you don't have to do time-based. You can do predictive analytics, you know, and look at when you need to do uh, do those PMs and not just take it down and do it just because. So that increases the compliance and also reduces risk from a NERC standpoint. And uh, of course, then, you know, for next steps, you know, how can you utilize these? You know, we can help talk to you about how you can help um, with predictive analytics, how we can help you with that, how we can help you improve looking at the information and getting it to you in a form that makes sense to you. Don't be a part of that. It's just get, you know, get, feel free to get in touch with us. Please do. Yeah. And the one thing I would add here is when we engage with the new customer um, and talk about what our technology does and the value it provides and so forth, we do it in a way whereby we, we relate it to what their process is so that we we can work together to actually save them money, save them time, save the, you know, reduce risk. And so we'll typically sit down and outline what the current issues that they're faced with are and how our technology can be used. And we'll then identify metrics that, okay, in the first 90 days, this is what, how we think uh, uh, we can positively impact your operation and then actually track it and then and show the ROI. We typically like to have it pay for itself inside of uh, one fiscal year, um, but we do it in a very uh, collaborative way. And so um, now with the search track portal and our alliance together, uh, it's even gonna be enhanced that much further, I believe. I think the <clears throat> predictive analytics is the, is the big selling point for this. It really helps plants understand what's going on with their equipment, you know, way in advance before it happens or without, and also without having to bring out somebody specialized to hook up their own machines. This will do it for you. It's always there. You can have it, look at it at any given time. Mm -hmm. yep. So at this time, uh, if we have some questions out there, you know, be, feel free to ask them and we'll answer them for you. Yeah, can you clarify? This is Mike Woodson at Comanche Peak, by the way. Um, I was just curious a little bit more on the vendor involvement as far as the, um, do you just develop the modeling and turn it over to the user, help us get it set up? But are you, are you actively analyzing everything or is it more just canned and you provide the software that analyzes our data? Well, if I, if I understand your question right, um, our software, Wave IQ platform, is analyzing the data, and the results of that analysis are then made available in a very, you know, in intuitive dashboards, to, so that the users of the platform can see the trends and the results of the analysis without having to be a data scientist expert. Some of our customers do have personnel that would like to see some of the raw data and have the ability to analyze it in, in maybe in their own way. And so that those features are available, but, but our platform is designed to do all the analysis within the platform and then, you know, provide the results to the users. If that answers your question. Yes. Thanks. Any other questions? Brandon, do we have anything? Any yeah, one about? question from the uh, chat. Can your platform integrate into third-party platforms? It can't. I mean, our platform can. We're integrating into the Search Trek portal, for example. Um, but we also do have a DMP3 um, communication native to our device to integrate directly into third-party SCADA systems. Um, and then we also provide APIs to integrate the third-party systems as well. 
Okay, um, one more question from the chat uh, from Jose Gonzalez. You talk about monitoring waveforms. When an anomaly happens, does the smart block send the alert to wave IQ or wave IQ needs to send the request? Who does the polling? Right. That's a good question. Um, each smart block edge device has an internal microprocessor that's analyzing the electrical signals continuous 24 seven. When there's a waveform of interest, such as a breaker trip or uh, a degrading waveform that um, the smart block it exceeds a threshold in the smart block, then the smart block without needing to be pulled by wave IQ will automatically send uh, that data file to wave IQ for further analysis um, at the server level. There are times where the Wave IQ platform is polling the device for, like at the end of each day, the Wave IQ may pull the device for all of the counts based on any type of uh, statistical anomalies that were discovered that day. Um, and that will typically happen if a, an adjacent feeder or bus had an issue that one smart block, if it's not communicating to the other smart block in a certain implementation, then Wave IQ will pull uh data from several devices uh so it's it's we have the ability to do both in our platform another question in the chat from mike dornish has this technology been used by coal plants to try and predict tube leaks we have done implementations in coal plants um monitoring the electrical signals as well and a tube link, I personally don't recall being one of the failure modes. However, um, we can pull some of our customers in coal plants that are using our uh, platform to see if that particular failure mode has uh, has come up and been addressed and how it manifested. So we'd be happy to get back to you on that one. Follow-up from Jose Gonzalez. There are sensors in the market that also take voltage and current measurement when the SCADA system makes a request. My understanding is that the SCADA system only takes an average of a certain number of cycles. How is the smart block different? Right, that's another good question. A, a typical um, SCADA pull from a device, so it's a, a SCADA system, there's a master dashboard control room and every so often, maybe every three seconds or every one minute, they will, the SCADA system will pull all the devices and say, tell me what your voltage levels are and your current levels right now at this instant in time. And what those devices on the panels do in those cases, they're basically reporting the average current level. So they might say it's five amps on this panel and it might be a hundred to one ratio. So that indicates 500 amps out in the yard. But they'll just provide that one number, 500 amps um, or 11 kV. Whereas our device, we're actually monitoring the electrical signal as it goes up and down with the sine wave. So it's it's rising to 500 amps and then it's falling to minus 500. And the the nature of that sine wave and how smooth that current and voltage transitions from minus the minus the, the low end of the peak and the high end of the peak of that sine wave, the way it transitions and moves is what our devices are monitoring. And so we will report to SCADA system what the magnitude of that sine wave is, you know, the average it's 500 amps or, and or we'll send to wave IQ that there's an issue, there's distortion in how it transitions and therefore um, there's an issue with the transformer or cap bank or a rester in the yard. And so um, it's a compliment to SCADA and it's, it's, but very different in a lot of ways in terms of the predictive analytics. Yeah, I would say that's definitely a lot faster resolution, a higher resolution time wise, right? Same thing, it's constant. It's yeah, it's like seven, you know, yeah. thousands of samples per second, second rather yeah. than, you know, one per five seconds. Another question, how many samples per cycle can the smart block do? Uh, by default, it's 128 samples per cycle. 
However, based on the uh, the use case, there may be times where we uh, change that to get a different resolution on our FFT Fourier transform for uh, frequency distortion. And so different customers will configure our devices for, for different, different sample rates. Okay, another question. Do you have an evaluation program? We do actually, we have what we call a uh, smart start pilot program. And depending on what your environment is, a wind turbine, a wind farm in this case, or solar or uh, t and grid, or even industrial plant generation, what have you, we have a uh, program designed for that environment. And it's a certain number of devices get installed over a certain amount of months. And uh, we really provide focused um, training and assistance so that you don't have to be an expert as you slowly learn how to uh, use our system. So yeah, it's very, we try to do it in a very user-friendly way, I guess. I guess uh, if there's no more questions, I, we'll give just a little bit um, and see, but I do appreciate all the, the questions that came in. Uh, always, uh, if, if you have some questions afterwards you think of, please uh, let us know. Uh, we can, you know, can get to us via email. And here's uh, how you can do that. You can go to the Star Trek uh, site and go here, or you can actually, I think we had some others, you can call us, there's our phone numbers, and then get back with you if you'd like to know more. Great. Well, thank you everybody for their time as well. Thank you, Evans. Yeah, thank you. I don't think we have any other questions, so I appreciate it. I think it was very informative. I hope the folks out there got some out. It looks like it based on the questions. There had some good ones. So you'll have a good day. Great. Okay, you too, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.